In this lesson, we'll be talking about another of our non-integer notations that is important to at least come close to mastering in order to excel on the quantitative reasoning section of the GMAT Focus Edition, and that's going to be exponential and radical notation. So let's first just define how exponential notation works. So you can see here an X raised to a Y above it, and the X is what is known as the base, and the y is what is known as the exponent. So the base is your numeric value. The exponent is the number of times that numeric value is multiplied by itself. So for instance, two to the fourth means two times two times two times two, because there's four twos multiplied together, and that gets us two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, and exponential growth comes from this idea that it just keeps on getting bigger, faster, and faster. Now, your only way to get to a negative value from exponential notation is when you have a base that is originally negative raised to an odd power. So negative two squared, and you can see it's in parentheses here because you have to remember our PEMDAS ordering of parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. but Negative two to the second means negative two times negative two, and those negatives cancel out and it becomes a positive four. But negative two to the third would be negative two times negative two, which becomes positive four. But then that positive four gets multiplied by one more negative two and it goes back to a negative eight. Now, our radical notation is kind of the inverse of our exponential notation. So the X is what is known as technically the radicand. There are no extra points for being able to identify and properly name a radicand, unfortunately, on this exam. And the Y outside of the commonly known as a square root symbol is what is known as the degree. And if there is no degree out there, it's assumed to be a square root. So our radical notation, the radicand, is the numeric value. It's kind of the same as the base to a degree. For exponential. The degree is the number of times that root value is multiplied by itself to produce the radicand. So the, the cube root of 64 is equal to 4 because 4, or sorry, 3 4s multiplied together would produce 64. And you're taking one of those 3 4s when you cube root 64. And you are unable to, at least for the purposes of this exam, square root a negative because that would produce what is known as the imaginary number. And the imaginary number is not allowed for the GMAT. And the reason it becomes an imaginary number is if you try to square root negative one, you have to square root something that produces the thing times itself. And negative one times negative one would produce positive one, not negative one. So there's nothing times itself that can produce a negative. So just a technical thing that you got to make sure you're careful with you cannot square root a negative as far as the GMAT goes. Then we've got to consider how the exponential notation can actually incorporate some of these square roots and radicals. So four to the one half power and any fractional power actually means the radical notation. So four to the one half is technically the square root of four. And you have to remember when you take an even root or even radical, you can get the positive or the negative outcome because positive two times positive two gives you four, but so too does negative two times negative two. So remember the possibility of negative outcomes for some harder problem solving questions that might involve square roots. <clears throat> then we've got a negative exponent and four to the negative two is going to require taking what is known as the reciprocal and then applying the positive exponent. So a negative exponent does not produce a negative base. If the base stayed, it was positive to start, it stays positive even though the exponent is negative. You just have to flip the numerator and the denominator, remembering that there is an implicit one as a denominator for all integers. So for four to the negative two, you would flip the fraction, take its reciprocal as one fourth, square both the numerator and the denominator to find that four to the negative second power would be equal to 1 16th. And then 4 to the 0 power is technically 1. And the proof is in the example here because we'll see in the next slide that when you divide bases, you subtract the exponents. 
And so if we had four to the fourth power divided by four to the fourth power, anything divided by itself is one. So that is four minus four or zero fours, which leaves behind the one and any value raised to the zero power is one because it's technically something divided by itself. And no matter what you divide by itself, the quotient is always one. So let's talk about how we further manipulate exponents with the same basis. So if you're multiplying the bases, you add the exponents. And the reason for that is if we've got four to the third times four to the fourth, we get four to the seventh because you have three fours multiplied together times four fours multiplied together, which becomes seven fours multiplied together. When you divide the bases, as we just spoke about, you're going to subtract your exponents. So when we've got four to the fourth divided by four to the third, that's going to be four to the first or just four because three of the fours in the denominator cancel out three of the fours in the numerator and you're left with just the one four. And remember that just like there is always a denominator of one implicit in all integers, there's also an implicit exponent of one for all integers. And if you're going to raise a base to the new power, you have to multiply your exponents. So for instance, if we had four to the fourth raised to the second power, that's going to give us four to the eighth because you have four times two and that gives you your four to the eighth because you've got four fours multiplied together. And then you're taking those four fours and then multiplying that product times itself, which is another four fours, hence four to the eighth. But if you're going to add or subtract your bases, you must factor before manipulating. One common mistake is looking at something like four to the second plus four to the second plus four to the second plus four to the second and saying, well, that's going to be four to the eighth because I just add the bases or keep the bases the same and add the exponents. That is not accurate because exponents indicate multiplication, not addition. So we have to factor the greatest common value to four to the second, four to the second, four to the second, and four to the second. And that, of course, is four to the second. So how do we get to the first four to the second? We'd multiply four to the second times one. Second four to the second would be the same thing. It'd be one. Third would be one. Fourth would be one. Then we can add all of those ones together to get to four. And we've got four to the second times four, which would be four to the third, which is going to be four times four times four, which is 64. And you can even track it back to our original expression. Four squared is 16. 16 plus 16 would be 32. 32 plus 16 would be 48. And 48 plus 16 would be that same 64. Now, when you have constant exponents, you can also combine. You can multiply your bases as normal. So for instance, two squared times five squared, because you have the same exponent, you could just keep the exponent constant and say that two squared times five squared is 10 squared. And our proof is four times 25 is indeed 100. You can also divide your bases as normal. So six squared divided by three squared, keep the exponent as a two, you will find that it's two squared. And sure enough, 36 divided by nine is equal to four. And you can factor your bases as normal as well. And so 8 squared plus 6 squared is going to be equal to 64 plus 36 equals 100. But we could still even factor a 2 out of both 8 squared and 6 squared. You can see that 2 squared factored out of 8 squared would leave behind 4 squared. 2 squared factored out from 6 squared would leave 3 squared. And that would be 4 times 16 plus 9, which lo and behold, 4 times 25 is equal to 100. And you can see just the flexibility of our notation. It's actually kind of uh, amazing, at least to me, to see the different ways in which you can manipulate exponents and come out with the same result at the end. So radicals are somewhat similar. You can multiply your radicands as norm normal, provided that you have the same degree uh, radical. So when we have the square root of 16 times the square root of 9, that's the square root of 144. And sure enough, 4 times 3 is 12. So again, as long as the radical is there, you could multiply anything that's underneath it, keeping the radical constant, and then do your square rooting at the end. You can also divide your radicands as normal. So if I've got 144 divided by, or square root of 144 divided by the square root of 36, well, that's going to be the square root of 4, and sure enough, 12 divided by 6 is 2. And you can even do it with irrational radicands, and this is something that the exam may do from time to time. So something like the square root of 80 divided by the square root of 5, you may be thinking those are crazy decimals, and they are. And the way to think about radicals is not as a decimal. It's actually the kind of thing that doesn't really fit within our biological paradigm of, you know, decimal system. But you can think of the square root of 80 as just half of the stuff that makes up an 80. Because if you take half of the stuff that makes up an 80 and you multiply it by the other half of the stuff that makes up an 80, boom, 80. 
And the square root of 5 is just half of the stuff that makes up a 5. So if you take half of the stuff of the 80 and divide that by half of the stuff that makes up a 5, it makes sense that you'd have to half of the stuff that makes up a 16. And it just so happens that 16 is a perfect square and pops out an integer of 4. You can also factor perfect squares to simplify them. So looking at the square root of 72, you could rewrite that as the square root of 36 times 2, all underneath the radical. And you can then pull out the 6 because the square root of 36 is the integer 6. And you can find that 6 times the square root of 2 is the simplified form of the square root of 72. So we've seen a lot of different ways to manipulate exponents and radicals. Let's move over to the whiteboard to see how we'll execute these types of manipulations on GMAT Focus Test A. So here, we'll set up our scratch work as we do every time. We got A through E, put a little line over top, and we're being asked for 4 to the 5th, how many times greater than symbol 8 to the 3rd power. So we got 0, 2, 4, 5, and 8. So when we're being asked how many times greater, that really means 4 to the 5th, using our English to math translations, equals x, which is our unknown, how many times, we don't know, times 8 to the 3rd. So and the first thing we always have to do is either get to a common base or a common uh, exponent. So here, it's probably easiest to recognize that 2 to the second is equal to 4, and 2 to the third is equal to 8. So I'm going to rewrite as a base of 2. So we've got 2 to the second to the fifth, is equal to x times 2 to the third to the third. So now we just process the exponents because we know that if we are raising the base to a new power, we multiply those exponents. So we've got 2 to the 10th is equal to x times 2 to the 9th. So now I can divide out 2 to the 9th from both sides. And we've got 2 to the first is equal to x. Now, this question actually could have been harder if we hadn't, uh, if we had included 1 as an option. We're not asking for the exponent result. We are asking for how many times greater. And so this is literally just saying that x is equal to 2 because we know that that implicit 1 of a power is there for every integer. And our correct answer is b. So once you get comfortable with exponential notation, radical notation, these questions can actually become relatively quick because it's just a matter of following the rules of the notation. So scrolling down, we'll take a look at one more, this time with radicals. So setting up our scratch work as always, we've got A, B, C, D, E. And when you've got a complex um, operation or... Uh, expression such as this. I'm not going to write that out as my question. I'm just going to say I've got to figure out what that's equal to. And I'm probably not even going to write out the answer choices because they're just overly complex. But we do need to write out the expression itself. So we've got the square root of 24 plus the square root of 32 times the square root of 8. <clears throat> so unfortunately, none of these are perfect squares. No, they just aren't. There's no square root of 24, 32, or 8 that is an integer. So we just want to find common terms within the parentheses. So I can rewrite this as the square root of 8, the square root of 24, that is, times 3. And then we've got the square root of 8 times 4. And that's times the square root of 8. And if you want to even further break it out, you could say it's the square root of 8 times the square root of 3. You can separate them because that might make it easier to see what we're going to do next. So we've got that plus the square root of 8 times the square root of 4 times the square root of 8. And anytime you multiply 
a square root by itself, it cancels out. So this square root of eight times this square root of eight just becomes an eight, but we can't get rid of the square root of three. So I know there's gotta be a eight square roots of three. And on the exam, you might be savvy enough to look at your answer choices at this point and go, well, I'm gonna have to add something to it so it can't be A. Maybe I get to 16 square roots of three if there's a second eight square root of three. So we gotta hold on to that one. If we've got 16 plus eight square roots of three, that's possible. Again, I could get to 24 square roots of three in choice D, but I can't get to 24 plus the square root of three if I've got eight square roots of three already. And then we go to the next term after the plus sign in the parentheses, eight times the square root of eight becomes an eight. And now we've got the square root of four, which just becomes a two. And so now we can combine that eight and the two to get to 16 plus eight times the square root of three. And that, of course, matches choice C. So you just have to follow the rules for how to combine the exponents and radicals. Remain calm, don't get intimidated by just a different way of processing math. You can also find a lot of square root, radical, and exponent drills over at mathaids.com that we talked about at the beginning of this course. So just practice, practice, practice these types of technical manipulations to improve your performance on a concept that you're going to see at least a couple of times in most quantitative reasoning sections on the GMAT focus exam.